Welcome back to the restoration of this Wang 2200F desktop mini computer from 1976. In part 2, the previous part, which you should watch if you haven't watched it yet because we are just continue from where we left off. In part 2, we've uh, refurbished, repaired and refurbished the entire power supply and power distribution system of this mini computer with uh, um, uh, reformed capacitors, uh, corrected short circuits, uh, changed a lot of uh, high power uh, semiconductors, uh, recapping all kinds of things, um, and fixed the problem with the chassis. Now, in this episode, uh, we are leaving the analog part behind, and we are going to go digital. There are uh, three main digital cards on this system, the CPU to the left, the memory board in the center, and the I.O. board to the right. And there is also a, a keyboard controller. But uh, let's start from my favorite chip in this whole thing, this gold-plated uh, ROM, <laughs> which is part of the I.O. board. That marbling is part of the package, it's not dirt, I was surprised with it. And taking the chip out of its socket, you can see very clearly uh, how uh, unspoiled uh, the pins are. The socket is a different story, I will clean it up. Um, actually, that's the first thing I did, I cleaned up that socket uh, with a contact cleaner and I put that wonderful chip back in its clean house. I um, also did some basic cleaning, you know, cleaning uh, residues of stickers, just so I could you know, touch uh, these cards uh, with pleasure and <laughs> not feeling a bit disgusted. So the next thing I did, I removed every socketed IC, every single one from each one of the three cards. Uh, but the, these are the ROMs, uh, what you see me removing now are the myriad of small ROMs in this system. I took them all out, I took the RAMs out, and I cleaned every single socket. So first with a quick brush, using an anti-static uh, brush, and I cleaned the board in between uh, uh, the different sockets. There, there was a lot of accumulated uh, dirt and grime uh, in there, so that was sort of needed. Then I use a contact cleaner uh, on every side of each of the sockets. I use two-pass contact cleaner, uh, a brand called Contact with two Ks, and they have the S and the U versions. Uh, the S is a sort of a primer, it loosens up the grime, and the U effectively cleans it and protects um, the sockets and contacts from further uh, corrosion. So once the contacts were cleaned, but still a little bit in a wet with the cleaner and the, the protector, I put the ICs back so some of that goodness <laughs> would stick on the pins as well and protect the pins. There was very, very little pin corrosion on these cards, so clearly this computer was not kept in a damp uh, environment, so that was good. So the RAMs uh, uh, are basically done, we are moving now to the, sorry, the ROMs were done, now the RAMs, lots of tiny little DRAM ICs, I had to use a set of fairly specialized IC pulling tools uh, to remove them, uh, those um, bypass capacitors right next to the sockets uh, made it quite difficult to sort of get the reach you need, uh, uh, the, the leveraging you need to pull the, the ICs out. Ultimately, of course, uh, it was possible. Uh, it was quite some time I'm speeding up this, I don't know, factor of 20. I don't know how much I'm speeding this up, uh, but uh, this took quite a while to do. Now, uh, the other ICs that you see there that are not socketed, those are the, the address decoding and, and, uh, and refreshing logic uh, in this board. Um, remember that there is no CPU, there's no Z80 anywhere which it, with its built-in DRAM refreshing logic. So they had to build everything out of TTL and that's what you see there. So same procedure, two-pass contact cleaner on every socket and then I put the ICs back exactly where they originally were just in case, you know, the socket sort of conformed with the idiosyncratic pin angles of each IC, so I'm putting them exactly uh, where they were while the sockets are still sort of wet uh, with the cleaning and lubricant uh, products um, that, that I've used. 
so enjoy this uh, this little montage one thing um, it is op no, good to say is that I think these boards have no defects in them unlike Moss Tech and Commodore which made terrible chips that uh, just don't last long you better replace them all if you have an old Commodore machine uh, Wang used quality chips and these ROMs are mask ROMs made to order for Wang they tend to be very reliable uh, and robust so I don't think um, these boards will have uh, defects uh, the same process I did in every single board. Of course, I, I, I sort of vacuum clean, not vacuum clean, the sort of, uh, uh, um, I blow, uh, blew away the dust using an ESD safe uh, uh, blower. Uh, repeated the process in the socketed ICs of the other boards. This board has a burn mark because it was very close to the end of the CRT, the neck of the CRT, so I'm just checking for continuity. Some of the traces are also very close together and I noticed that Wang sort of scratched the boards to make sure there would be no shorts, which sort of raised alarm bells, so I decided to check for shorts uh, across those, those little uh, traces as well. Of course, I, one cannot forget uh, the edge connectors, so I'm using uh, um, a strong contact cleaner here on a lint-free uh, um, yeah, how, how do you call this tool? It's it's like a glorified uh, cotton bud, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't leave any lint behind. I didn't need to use a, a fiberglass pen because the contacts are in very good shape. They just needed some cleaning and lubrication. Now, there are loads of these little uh, catmat uh, electrolytic capacitors all over uh, these boards. Uh, the vast majority of them is for decoupling decop the coupling and bypassing, so regulating the power rails. Therefore, their values are not very important. They tend to be 15, 18 microfarads. I replaced them all with the 22 microfarad modern capacitors. But this one had a different value that I couldn't read, 104K. I was in doubt what exactly this meant. So I decided to check this IC, see if it had good ESR so I could leave it behind. But it didn't. Now, 19 ohms. Now, some consider this acceptable ESR or equivalent series resistance. I don't. I think the electrolyte is dry, so I will change this capacitor. So I put it out, um, trying to measure it, uh, the capacitance off circuit with my multimeter. And there you go, I get 110 nanofarads. So this is a 100 nanofarad capacitor, 0 0.1 microfarad, uh, which is a very small value for an electro electrolytic capacitor. But as luck would have it, I did have one, right, very appropriate in stock, 0 0.1 microfarad, 50 volts. It is radio, so I had to stretch the legs a little bit, uh, but it, it was just fine. There was another one below on this image to the left, below and to the left, another Nichicon that uh, is also radio and is stretched a little bit. But all the other capacitors I could replace with the appropriate axial uh, equivalents, modern equivalents, just a little bit higher capacitance, but that's not a problem at all because, again, the vast majority of these capacitors are just to, to make sure that there is no ripple uh, the, in the power rails, that the power rails are stable. So using a slightly higher capacitance uh, is, is not a big problem at all, uh, especially given the fact that I'm replacing electrolytic for electrolytic. So the frequency response of these new capacitors shouldn't be very different from, from that of the old ones. So we just saw you know, these blue capacitors on the I.O. board. They are all new. All the capacitors you're seeing now is after the boards have been recapped, all the sockets cleaned, uh, all the edge connectors cleaned. So this is the sort of the final result of the refurbishment. And back to that little capacitor <laughs> that I showed in the beginning. These are the victims. I think there were more. These are, these are the victims from one or two boards. There were more at the end. And this is uh, the final result. So assuming there are no actual defects and all the ICs are fine, this completes uh, the process for the large digital cards. Which brings our attention to the keyboard, because underneath, you see, underneath the keyboard, there is a digital board that connects to, to that connector there. The connector goes into that socket. That's how the keyboard uh, talks to the rest of the system. And this is a digital board as well. So we need to have a close look at this. I didn't have the opportunity to test the keyboard because the computer didn't boot. 
But there are a few uh, high voltage IC drivers, uh, a flip flop uh, chip in there. That large uh, EA chip, that's a custom chip made for Wang. Uh, this is a keyboard matrix decoder. I hope this one is fine, otherwise, I have to figure out how to, to replace that. There are two ROMs. And then, based on the schematics, uh, I started studying the design of this thing so I can develop a plan of attack. What do I want to replace? Uh, what can I test offline before I put this back into, a, into the real system? So, w what should I do to refurbish this board? I'm particularly concerned about the high frequency drivers that are used to dim the incandescent lights connected to the keyboard. Um, one of them, uh, and there you see me holding one of these incandescent lights, uh, they are 24 volt uh, lights. Uh, this one measures 50 ohm, which is exactly what you would expect, so this, this bulb is okay. The other one is not, as you will see, the other one is an open circuit, so it's being blown, which is normal, you know, these bulbs blow after a while, but you know, there is always the suggestion that you know, something could have happened, a surge in current somewhere that could have blown this. So again, I want to look at those high voltage drive ICs um, because uh, these bulbs are connected straight to the 25 volt line from one side and on the, the other side they are connected to those high voltage drivers. So when the drivers uh, drive the other side to 25 volts, the, the, the light dims. So they, they, uh, they operate very hot, so that's why I'm removing the first one of them to have a closer look. This is the 7407, it's a non-inverting high voltage uh, driver. This is the one that drives the light bulb that is blown. And I see some charring on the other side of the board, so I thought I'll pull this one out, uh, have a close look uh, at it. You see there is some charring there. So as I remove it, it's stubborn, but I did remove all the solder. There it goes. Yeah, there is charring right underneath it as well. It does operate very hot. So I'm going to change both of them. There is a 7406 right above it, marked already. Um, it, it is, it, it's just the inverting version of this high voltage driver. I don't like to keep stuff that operates under high temperature. So uh, for, just for the heck of it, I'm going to test uh, this IC. Now you can see better here after I pulled it how the board is really charred uh, underneath that I see. Now, driving 24 volts is not easy. Um, I did put it in a tester. This tester, of course, doesn't test reliability, stability over uh, a high temperature operation. It just tests to see if it works a little bit, if it drives uh, a voltage. And as you will see, this one does still work, but that sa says nothing about how stable it works. It says nothing about how close to failing it is. And those char chart marks on the board just uh, make me uneasy. I'm going to replace both of them. I'm also going to replace a flip-flop that is connected to the drivers, because old TTL flip-flops are just not reliable. This is the other driver, the inverting driver. I, I am pulling it out after having desoldered it. See, charred as well underneath, and uh, it turns out this one tests out okay as well. Um, but I replaced them both, and I replaced the flip-flop. These old TTL flip-flops, they are funny circuits, if you look at them, they, they are very counterintuitive, and you know, one wonders what were they thinking <laughs> when they, they, I'm sure there is some cost reason associated with that, but uh, I feel uneasy with these old flip-flops, 7474, so I changed that one as well. But for now, we are looking at uh, the 7406 inverting high voltage driver, and um, yeah, it does pass a quick test, but again, we don't know whether it's really reliable still. Now, of course, I will recap the board, but I was just toning out all the diodes and capacitors just to make sure, and this capacitor measures as, an, as over the limit in terms of ESR. It looks like just an open circuit. Um, so I decided to, yeah, I'm measuring the ESR now. I, I was measuring capacitance before with my multimeter, and it gave me a very low capacitance, like 100 nano. It's supposed to be 50 micro. And uh, the ESR gives an over the limit. So I was in doubt, and I decided to, to test the capacitor next to it to make sure that the tester is okay. The tester is okay. 
but this capacitor is just uh, busted. Uh, it's just an open circuit. It, it has very little capacitance uh, left. So the question is, is this a defect? Is this a bypass or de decoupling capacitor? And if you look at the schematics, it's not. Together with that transistor, Q1, it controls the timing of the clicker signal. So this is a defect. The keyboard uh, uh, was not operating uh, with this capacitor so uh, 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 failed. I mean, this, this is not a capacitor anymore. It's just an open circuit. I decided to test it off circuit as well, just to make sure I'm not going nuts and my, my testing tools are okay. And you see it's, uh, it's over the limit. So this is clearly a defect. There was a defect uh, on this keyboard the timing of the tr of the clicker signal uh, would not be correct, um, which makes me wonder as well, you know, that transistor right next to it, right underneath it on the board, which controls the timing of the clicker signal, uh, is that reliable? I don't know why this capacitor failed so dramatically, so I decided to change that transistor as well. And that's what you see now. Transistor is new, all the capacitors are new, the board is fully recapped, uh, cleaned the sockets, I, closed the windows of the EEPROMs, not to lose their contents, and you see the three socketed ICs there, they have changed them, the two high voltage drivers uh, and a flip-flop. And I, of course, cleaned the edge connector as well. And this brought this refurbishment of the digital part uh, to an end. All boards are now, four boards are refurbished. So stay tuned for the next episode, which is the grand conclusion of this series. The Wang uh, will come back to life in a glorious way. So until then, take care, and I will see you soon again.